In this presentation module, uh, we talk about another attack on logic locking, uh, and it's called the SAT attack. Uh, it's actually an attack that is based on solving a satisfiability problem. A uh, SAT solver is used in the process. This was a powerful attack uh, when it was developed in 2015 because it broke all the existing logic locking solutions existing back then. So next, we talk about the SAT attack. Um, SAT attack is um, in terms of threat model, similar to sensitization attack, the assets are the same, uh, but the approach is different. In sensitization attack, the idea was to sensitize individual keybits to the outputs using testing pr principles, and we covered this in the previous module. In SAT attack, the idea is to prune the key search space, uh, and we do so iteratively. In every iteration, uh, more and more incorrect keys are pruned away and eventually the idea is to to be left with the correct key. So next we talk about the details of SAT attack and this attack by the way was developed by uh, by the Princeton group research group in Princeton and it was presented in host 2015. Um, as I said earlier the threat model is identical uh, to the one in sensitization attack the assets are the same. There is a functional chip that is used as an oracle. There's a reverse engineer netlist on which the SAT solver is, is uh, applied and uh, the computations are performed. And the goal is the same. The attacker's goal is the same. It's to determine the secret key. It's just that the approach is slightly different. Uh, the idea is to prune the key search space iteratively. So here's how SAT attack works. So we start with the lock net list, which is a reverse engineered net list. Um, originally, let's say we have 100 key bits, uh, so the key search space consists of 2 to the 100 possible uh, key values, and we will slowly pr prune the incorrect keys away. Um, this information, the net list, is turned into a CNF form, conjunctive normal form, and it's fed uh, to a SAT solver, and the SAT solver tries to first identify something called a distinguishing input pattern, or it's also called discriminating input pattern. So what's a discriminating input pattern, or in short, DIP? A DIP is an input combination that will produce different outputs for two different key values. So what's significant about a DIP? Well, if we can identify an input pattern like that, we can, if we can identify a dip, then this means one of the key values is definitely a wrong key value and it can be pruned away. So the SAT solver produces a dip if it exists and this dip is applied to the oracle, to the functional chip, so that we get the outputs of the correct working chip to this dip. And that output will tell us um, the key values that produce wrong outputs and the, that the oracle's response is therefore used to prune away all the wrong keys that lead to wrong outputs. So this information, the dip, as well as the response of the oracle to the dip, the output values, this is fed back into the CNF formula, embedded in the formula, and in the subsequent iterations of the SAT solver, um, this information is included. And this iteratively grows. In the next iteration, we look for another dip and then we go to the oracle, get the response. So gradually the CNF formula grows and gradually more and more uh, key values are pruned away. And eventually, um, at some point, the SAT solver will tell us there is no more dip. Um, and at that point, we'll know that all the remaining key values in the key source space are valid keys. So ideally, we'll be left with only the correct key and uh, this is how we break logic locking in an iterative fashion by using a SAT solver in the process. So how effective is the SAT attack? It really depends on how powerful the dips are in terms of distinguishing the incorrect keys from the correct keys. So we'll illustrate that on an example first. Um, in this example what we have is a simple circuit with three inputs A, B, C and a single output Y and it has been logic locked with three key bits, which means that there are eight possible values for the key. 
K6 is the correct key value. As it can be seen, it's all green entries underneath the K6 column. Uh, for K6, the design produces the correct outputs, and all the other uh, key values are incorrect keys. So when set attack is applied on this little circuit, let's say in the first iteration, set attack identifies uh, dip as the pattern 011. Now, the pattern 011 can distinguish K4 from the rest of the key values because K4 is the only key for 011 pattern that produces a wrong output. So, in the first iteration, only K4 is pruned. In the second iteration, let's say dip 111 is identified, and this input pattern, this dip, can distinguish only K1, so that key value is pruned. In the third iteration, uh, 101 prunes only K7. And in the fourth iteration, uh, the dip 100 is identified by the SAT solver. And this is a powerful dip because it can actually distinguish all the incorrect keys from the one correct key, which is K6. So after the fourth iteration, um, the SAT solver, the SAT attack, will terminate successfully identifying K6 as the correct key value. So, as it can be seen, in every iteration, a dip eliminates a number of different key values. And it really depends on how the incorrect keys of that particular logic locking solutions behave. Uh, it's a matter of whether this dip or these dips that are produced in every iteration are powerful in terms of this, their distinguishing ability. Um, so, the more incorrect keys that a dip eliminates in an iteration, the quicker the side attack will terminate successfully. So that directly affects the computational uh, effectiveness of the side attack. How powerful are these dips in terms of their distinguishing ability? Um, and at that time, when the side attack was developed back in 2015, it broke all the existing uh, logic locking solutions. Uh, here's a little experiment that shows the application of the SAT attack on strong logic locking. Strong logic locking, if you remember, we covered this in the previous module. Uh, it was developed um, as a defense against the sensitization attack. Um, and as we can see, uh, when SAT attack is applied on strong logic locking, uh, yes, the key sizes are small in this experiment. They, they vary from 10 to 14. But a very small number of dips can actually help break the logic locking solution. So the SAT attack can very quickly, in a matter of split second, uh, can identify the key of strong logic locking. Um, and even for larger key sizes, it is going to be effective as well. So strong logic locking, just like all the other logic locking solutions existing in 2015, is vulnerable to the SAT attack. So what can we do to thwart the SAT attack? How can we prevent uh, against the SAT attack. We need to come up with a logic locking solutions where the distinguishing ability of the dips are limited. So ideally, if we can make sure that our logic locking solution um, results in a behavior where each dip eliminates only one incorrect value, then this is the best case scenario against the SAT attack. Because this means that the number of dips that's required for the set attack to break our logic locking solution will be equal to all possible uh, key number of key values. And in this case, you know, the key values is obviously the number of key, different keys is exponential in key size. So the number of iterations that the set attack will take to terminate will be exponential in key size. And that's precisely what we want. We want to get um, resilience against set attack in a matter that is exponential in the key size. That's a powerful defense. So we want in every iteration for the, the depths to eliminate exactly one key value. That is the best best case. So side attack was um, presented in host 2015 and in host 2016 we uh, presented the first side attack resilience solution that we referred to as Sarlacc. Um, in Sarlock, the idea is to add additional unit around the logic cone that we'd like to protect. So the units that we add um, consist of 
um, a comparator, a mask unit, and an XOR gate that flips the output. Um, so the comparator compares the input value applied to the logic cone at that instant in time against the key, the secret key. If the key is not the same as the input value, nothing happens, but if they're the same, then a flip is produced uh, to change the, the output value, to flip the output value. And the mask is there to make sure that the functionality is not broken, so for the correct key, uh, this flip is suppressed. So this is the idea in, in Serlock. So what happens in Serlock really is we get this truth table, as we can see in the diagonal, we have the flips uh, in all positions except for the position corresponding to the uh, correct key value k2 uh, at that at that uh, when when uh, the input pattern 2 is applied to the circuit because the correct key is in place uh, that flip is suppressed so the output is still correct but for all other incorrect keys um, there will be a flip at the output at the input corresponding to the incorrect key value um, and as as we can see if you look at any of the input patterns that the SAT solver may identify to be the dip, that dip is going to distinguish only one incorrect key from the rest of the keys. So in every iteration of the SAT attack, at most one uh, key, incorrect key, will be pruned, resulting in, a, uh, in an exponential compl uh, complexity, computational comp complexity for the SAT attack. So the number of dips is expected to be exponential. And that's the resilience against the SAT attack. Now, um, Serlock has a vulnerability, and it's a structural vulnerability. When this netlist is reverse engineered, it will be very easy to identify the structures for the XOR driving the output, for the mask unit, and for the comparator. And the real problem is that the logic cone that we want to protect, it's implemented as is. So once these surrounding units are identified, the attacker will say, hey, these are the Serlock blocks. So the attacker will just remove these blocks and recover the logic cone that we'd like to uh, protect. So Serlock is vulnerable to the removal attack as long as these blocks are identified by a reverse engineer. Uh, a removal attack will simply remove them and the remaining uh, logic will be the logic cone that we're trying to protect. So very recently we uh, proposed another solution that is both uh, side attack and removal attack resilient and we call the solution TTLock. In TTLock we do not use a mask and instead what we do is we actually modify the logic cone. So instead of uh, implementing the logic cone as is, which is problematic in terms of uh, resilience against the removal attacks, we actually make a modification and implement in hardware a modified logic cone, which is different than the original logic cone. Now, the modification in this logic cone is very minor. What we do is, for only one input pattern, we flip the output with respect to the original logic cone. And we, this input pattern, we refer to it as the protected input pattern. And this protected input pattern corresponds to the secret key. So only for the secret key, only for the input pattern corresponding to the secret key, the modified logic cone normally produces a wrong output. This wrong output is restored by the comparator unit, again, only for the secret key. So when the secret key is in place and when that input pattern is applied to the logic cone, uh, to the modified logic cone, the protected input pattern comes and uh, the, the flip embedded in the modified logic cone is restored and we get the correct output. So um, as a result of this we get this behavior represented in this, in this truth table. As we can see for the correct key value which is k0 um, there is no flip at the, at the output so the, 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 the functionality is not broken but for all the other incorrect key values we see two flips. Now why two flips? Well, one flip is the flip that we embedded in the modified logic cone that corresponds to the protected input pattern, which is 0, 0, 0. And the other flip is an attempt of the comparator to actually restore that flip. But that restore operation actually is wrong 
for all the incorrect values. It's correct only for the uh, correct key value, k0. So that's why we have two flips in all the incorrect keys, for all the incorrect keys, uh, but we have no flip for the correct key, uh, for the correct key, the, the circuit works. And even if somebody reverse engineers this netlist and they remove the comparator block and they remove the XOR block, they'll be left with the modified logic on, not the original logic on, and that's our protection against removal attack. Now, we again expect resilience against the SAT attack because if we pick any dips other than the protected input pattern, the dip will eliminate only one incorrect key value. Uh, it will distinguish only one incorrect key value. If the SAT attack is fortunate enough to hit the protected pattern and identify it as a dip, then of course it will terminate in a single iteration. It will identify all the incorrect key values. But the chances of that happening is exponentially small because we're looking for that pattern in 2 to the k patterns. So again, we expect um, exponential uh, complexity, exponential resilience against the SAT attack. And we verified this on uh, experimentally on uh, small benchmarks, on a few small benchmarks. We actually experimented with uh, small key sizes again to illustrate the exponential behavior. Um, when the SAT attack is applied on TT lock, we observe that both the number of dips and the execution time of the SAT attack grows exponentially in the size of the key, and that tells us that TT lock is resilient against the SAT attack. So if we implement TT lock with 100 bits of key, then we expect the execution time, the complexity of the SAT attack to be in the order of 2 to the 100, um, and that's, uh, that's a good uh, guarantee against uh, SAT attack. Uh, and in terms of cost, we're really talking about the cost of making the modification in the net in the or logic cone, which is really minor. And this modification can actually be used to re, uh, to lower the cost of implementation with respect to the original cone. So the the cost could be positive or negative uh, in that sense. Um, but the real cost uh, comes from the comparator block, and the size of the comparator block increases linearly uh, with the size of the key. And we observe that uh, for s even small benchmarks, the area power delay numbers are quite small. We expect these numbers to be even smaller, actually negligible, for very large uh, circuits where a comparator can easily be tolerated. So in this presentation module, we discussed SAT attack, a very powerful attack that broke all logic locking solutions uh, at the time when it was proposed. Um, we also talked about how we can protect against the SAT attack. It's all about the distinguishing ability of the dips of the SAT attack. And uh, we talked about the efforts. Um, SAR lock, TT lock are a couple of uh, SAT attack resilience solutions. We presented them. Um, there are actually other SAT attack resilience solutions as well. And the uh, upcoming module will talk about them. Thank you very much for listening.